May 1945. The war in Europe was over and Germany was occupied. The victors only seemed to be pals. Behind the scenes, the world split into East and West, preparing for a new war. The United States against the Soviet Union. The Americans knew almost nothing of their opponent's strength and pursued aerial reconnaissance regardless of cost. Aerial combat over Soviet territory left at least 155 casualties. It's an airborne chess game, we call it. it just a constant chess game. Мы все время были догоняющей как бы стороной. Мы играли черными в этой игре. A deadly game. There were electronic and photo reconnaissance flights deep into the Soviet Union. A secret war in the air. I felt a little intrusive. Not bad. Nikit Sergey, если б я мог, я превратился бы в ракету, сам полетел, взорвался бы, но сбил этого паразита. The premise that the other side would strike made you think perhaps it would be much better if you struck first. A dangerous battle for world supremacy. The superpowers aerial espionage war was kept a secret of the Cold War. The only people who didn't know what we were doing were the Russian people and the American people. The two governments know. Only one missing person's fate is fully known. October 1952, an American long-range reconnaissance plane was spying north of Japan over the Soviet border area. Soviet fighter planes took off. A sailor on board a battleship, Vasily Saiko, was listening to the radio communications. Eight Americans on board the RB-29 died. One of them had been married for just two years and had recently become a father, John Dunham. His wife Mary was waiting for him in the USA. I was ironing clothes one day, I noticed that the TV was talking about this B-29 that was shot down um, <clears throat> over near the, near the Kuril Islands. And uh, it was from Yokota Air Force Base. And I thought, I wonder if my husband knows any of the men on that plane. The crew on the Soviet ships saw the plane shot down and searched for survivors. Vasily Saiko found one of the pilots. И думали, что то, ну, он может живой там, что не видели мы ничего. А потом, ну, в ныре, я его раз так схватил, потаскал себе смотрим, ой, да, что без головы уже, ну, был труп. The US Air Force sent Mary Dunham a telegram, informing her that her husband was missing. First, I was numb with shock, and then. I went through a period of denial, and then, and then the feeling started to return, and then it felt as though I felt as though someone had taken a cleaver and just sliced me in half right, right down the middle. It was like all my nerve endings were, you know, my bloody nerve endings were hanging out and the, exposed to the elements, and it was terrible, terrible, exquisite pain. Vasily Saiko brought his gruesome find, the dead John Dunham, ashore. He kept his dead enemy's ring. Такая у меня появилась мысль, чувство такое, что я видел, я рассказать хотел об этой троей, как, как он погиб, где погиб. Вот это вещественное доказательство, и послужил персень. 
He kept the ring for over 40 years. When the Cold War came to an end, he took it to the American Embassy. Those people who were so poor could give up this valuable ring to, to make an American feel better, an American family feel better, that they were thinking about us during all those years. It's just, it's just incredibly wonderful. And I can't say enough good about, about them. Enemies became friends. Vasily Saiko visited Mary Dunham in the USA. She gave the ring to the daughter who had never met her father. John Dunham's remains were exhumed in the Kuril Islands and returned to the USA. He was buried with full military honors at Arlington National Cemetery, the only one of 155 spy pilots who went missing during the secret Cold War. Wiesbaden, April the 8th, 1950. At the headquarters of the US Air Force in Europe, a briefing was given. 10 electronic specialists were given a secret mission. That afternoon, a privateer reconnaissance plane took off, officially for Copenhagen. In fact, Captain John Fett and co-pilot Howard Zeschaff had another target. They were interested in the testing of new Soviet submarine-launched missiles. They were to eavesdrop on Soviet radio communications, measure radar emissions, and collect data. Как раз 8 апреля передали Германии, что 12 часов вышел. The Soviets knew all about the flight. They had Wiesbaden, an American Secret Service stronghold, under constant surveillance. They had agents at the airbase at Erbenheim or working nearby. A network of Soviet spies operated all over Germany. We were briefed that uh, there were several thousand uh, Soviet and East German agents of one nationality or another that were spying on military and, and civilian sectors. No one knew then that the Soviets had made a decision. For the first time, they would use force to bring down a spy flight. As the privateer approached the Lithuanian coast, radar stations reported the flight and Soviet fighter interceptors took off. One of the pilots was Anatoly Garasimov. Вот мы подходим, я показываю ему, давай за мной. И покачал крыльями, и разворот на нашу территорию, чтобы он шел за мной. Он эту команду не выполняет. А сигнал, договоренность была, если сигнал не, не выполняет команду, молния, это значит огонь. Ну и вот мы начали его атаковать. The Americans were horrified. They were flying outside the 12-mile zone, and the Soviets had never attacked before. Ощущение неприятное, я должен сказать. Коллега все-таки же, да? И и и и убивать, а проказ. Я муж тоже дают проказы. Иди, нарушай. И нам дают проказ. British radar had observed the action. For the press, the Americans stuck to their cover story that an unarmed training flight had got lost. A frantic search began. Oil slicks and pieces of wreckage were soon found. Then the privateer's nose wheel with a bullet hole in it. Then a life raft. The hatches for first aid and survival rations had been opened. Were there any survivors? The Soviets claimed they had shot down a US spy plane over their territory and it had exploded. The Americans abandoned their search with no sign of the crew. Five years later, the American John Noble, released from the Gulag, claimed he'd seen the crew of the privateer at Vorkuta, which the Soviets denied. The case remained a mystery. The story behind the story is the last great secret of the Cold War. Even Garasimov thought he'd fired on a very different kind of spy. Тогда в это время у Литве образовались бандитские группировки, и американцы в это время помогали им и оружием, и боеприпасами, и продовольствием. 
и нарушали, ходили и сбрасывали это, вот это и нарушали нашу государственную границу. George F. Kennan developed the strategy of using partisans to destroy the Soviet Union from within. Assisting him was Reinhard Galen, Hitler's master spy now working for the Americans. As he had under Nazism, he recruited Soviet defectors, this time among Europe's displaced persons, forced laborers, exiles from the East, refugees. They were trained as agents and partisans in secret camps in the USA and Germany. This is a real training film with real volunteers, hence the masks. The agents also learned the importance of details like adopting local hairstyles, dressing in the appropriate price range and having a perfect cover story. Hundreds were dropped by speedboat or plane in the Baltic or the other Soviet satellites. Once more, Wiesbaden played a central role. Here, the pilots were briefed. They knew just enough to carry out their missions, no more. For the first time, one of these pilots is prepared to talk on camera about his still top secret operations. We would meet the people at the airplane. Who they were, what they did, I don't know. The pilot knew only where the men were to be dropped. You know, it was flying at 500 feet at nighttime, lights out, and uh, go in and deliver somebody. Hedge hopping under the radar, a job for specialists. We flew through the mountains in that area. Needless to say, we were very busy with the maps. We had three maps in the cockpit. We had one in the navigator's hand, one in each pilot's hand. And uh, oh, what we were doing was making sure where we were at. Their targets lay in the Soviet satellite states, often Latvia, Romania, Albania, and the Ukraine. The agents usually parachuted in, though sometimes the planes landed to pick people up. This training film shows a perfect operation. The agent is met by a resistance group. Any broken bones? No, I think I made it all one piece. Our friend's farm is up the hill there, just about a mile. Uh, I'll show you the way. The reality was entirely different. The operations were completely infiltrated by the Soviets. In Britain, the head of the Soviet section of MI6, Kim Philby, betrayed the missions to his real bosses in Moscow. Soviet guards were usually waiting when the agents were dropped. The idea of bringing down communist countries from within was an illusion destined to fail, which is probably why these operations have remained secret until now. Certainly, Western secret services learned next to nothing about the actual strength of the Soviet military apparatus. The Iron Curtain remained impenetrable and tensions rose. 1948, the blockade of Berlin. Stalin was extending his empire in Europe and China had become communist. The man in charge of dropping atomic bombs on Japan, General Curtis LeMay, organized the Berlin airlift. His ambitions went beyond taking in supplies. He frankly stormed out, yelled out, he says, now that's not true, I didn't just start that thing, he says. We could have, I was sitting there arguing like the devil that all, for, for the people to take a tank or so and, and a, a line of trucks and just bulldoze right through those, uh, those uh, blockades. He says, we could have done it, what would they have done? We did have the bomb and they didn't. 1949. The first Soviet atom bomb exploded, years before the West had expected it. 1950, the Korean War began. 55% of Americans believed it was the beginning of the Third World War. Was this war also stage managed by the Soviets? Did Stalin want world supremacy at any price? Truman sanctioned the use of the atomic bomb. The world was poised on the brink of nuclear war. High-ranking U.S. soldiers such as LeMay thought that war was inevitable and should begin sooner rather than later while the Soviets were still weak. 
At the Air War College, war games were run to test whether and how the Soviet Union could be forced to her knees. It was concluded that the effects of the nuclear bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki were not as massive as anticipated. It was the first use of nuclear weapons on civilians and the consequences of the radiation were horrendous, but industrial production had resumed within a month. A nuclear war on the Soviet Union would last a year, and if the US were the aggressors, would cost less than three million American lives. But the enemy would not be annihilated, and how could the giant empire be occupied? The two superpowers therefore worked hard to improve their nuclear weapons, with success. From 1955, a nuclear war meant worldwide destruction. To deliver their atomic bombs, the Soviet Union built a copy of the Hiroshima bomber, the B-29. They also did some saber rattling, despite their obvious military inferiority. Вопрос о том, о превентивном ударе, он встал. И у нас были такие выступления военачальников в открытой печати, которые призывали это сделать. Но наше руководство на это не пошло. By now, the Americans had a new bomber, the Convair Peacemaker, the B-36. In contrast to the B-29, it could reach its target and fly back to base. A giant machine with 10 engines capable of 30 hours flight. The B-36 makes a noise that you would never forget if you ever heard it. Uh, I happened to live at Fairchild. I lived in a trailer park where the B-36s on final approach went over, and our trailer would jump, 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 jump. This thing would go, you know. There was also an ultralight version a high-altitude reconnaissance plane full of aerial cameras, one with a focal length of six meters. In 1953, Doug Morell took part in special photographic missions that are still classified and officially never happened. They took him over the satellite states, perhaps also over the Soviet Union. Soviet MiGs tried to catch the B-36, but they couldn't. It flew too high for them. One of the navigators says, hey, there's some fighters down there coming up. We weren't thinking anything about it, you know. And uh, they were heading our way like this, he says, and they, they couldn't quite make it. They mushed around there for a while. These flights produced aerial photographs for new maps of the Soviet Union, locating the major targets for a possible nuclear war. Until then, the U.S. Air Force had worked with outdated German maps based on Nazi reconnaissance photographs taken before their attack on the Soviet Union in 1941. So for the Soviets, they were particularly sensitive to any flights over their nation. Uh, some of them, I'm sure, were thinking that's possibly the prelude to war. On the other hand, the United States uh, suffered Pearl Harbor and Pearl Harbor was caused by a lack of knowledge. Again, the Americans knew next to nothing, but they believed the gross exaggerations of Soviet propaganda. 1954, Aviation Day fly pass at Tushino. The Soviets showed off their new bomber, the Myasichev Bison. Was it combat ready? How many were there? That could only be found out by daylight photo reconnaissance. This dangerous job was given to a U.S. squadron based in England and recently equipped with modern jets. As we came out of the briefing room, Colonel Joe Preston grabbed me by the arm and said, uh, bring your crew uh, with me. So we followed our wing commander to an another place in the same building where we had target study rooms. Hal Austin was told the operational details with typical military brevity. He says, I do not want you to keep a separate log, as navigator always did, he says, you write that down on this map. I don't want you writing it place else. And if anything happens to you on this mission, you're to eat that map. Austin was told to overfly and photograph nine Soviet bomber bases. What did he think when he was given this mission? World War III, that was the uppermost of our 
uh, training through that whole time frame. So when we get to 1954 and uh, we get our new airplanes, uh, we're all anxious to get combat ready in that new airplane. We're in England and then we're given this mission to fly. Uh, and, uh, you know, after the fact, uh, we're kind of wondering, well, maybe the purpose of that mission was to start World War III. I don't know. We're professionals. That's what uh, General May uh, uh, trained us to do. Uh, when somebody told us what the mission was, we're going to listen to that mission and uh, never any thought of doing anything except flying the mission as we're briefed to fly. Three jets headed for Norway, like a normal training flight. When two planes turned back, their crews were horrified to see Austin flying on in the direction of the Soviet Union. A short while later, he reached the coast. At first, all went well. They took the first photos. About the uh, time we crossed the uh, third target is when we saw the first fighters. And they were uh, apparently uh, MiG-15s. Uh, they were nowhere near our altitude. The MiGs can even be seen in Austin's reconnaissance photographs. But his bomber could fly higher than the MiG-15s. What neither Austin nor the intelligence officers who planned his flight knew was that the Soviets had stationed a new fighter plane in the area, the MiG-17. It could fly just as high as the Boeing. These MiGs came within firing range. I saw some funny looking things going both above and below the airplane that were tracers. And of course, I knew what tracers looked like from film, but uh, that's the first time that I'd seen one. And Holt was saying, well, they're making passes at us. And I made uh, uh, a couple of snide remarks about that intelligence officer that told us not to worry about MiG-17s. Helen is yelling at me in the nose uh, to make my corrections uh, headings uh, uh, to get that next target. Shrapnel then knocked out our intercom. It was riddled if you will, with holes. In a damaged plane that was losing fuel, Austin continued his mission, shook off the MiGs, photographed the remaining targets, and got as far as Finland. He was in urgent need of fuel and called for a tanker over his shot-up radio. The tanker pilot at the British base could barely hear him. So he heard our call sign, recognized my voice. He called the tower at Milton Hall, said he was gonna launch, make an emergency launch to refuel a B-47. The tower said, uh, said negative, uh, he could not launch because we have an emergency in progress. A fighter plane in difficulties wanted to land. The tanker pilot objected. I'm declaring an emergency to launch this airplane. So how long? And the uh, fighter come back, said about five minutes. He said, gives me time to get off. He said, told the tower, he says, I am taking off. Despite the air traffic controller's threats, the tanker pilot took off and found Austin over the North Sea in the nick of time. Holt swears to this day that all the fuel gauges had quit wiggling by the time we uh, leveled off behind the tanker. The photos were safe. They would prove that the Bison bomber did not yet pose a threat. Frankfurt and Wiesbaden were home to the 7499th support group. Its harmless name belied its role as one of the most important units of American spy planes. Crammed with recording devices, the aircraft monitored radio communications, radar positions and Soviet infrastructure, a kind of electronic vacuum cleaner that picked up everything. One of the specialists on board was Robert Keefe, aged 20. People in my outfit who were 22, we thought of it as rather old. Uh, and people at that age don't have uh, the sense of imminent danger. I'd like to say that they don't have brains enough, but it's not, they, life is too, too new. I mean, you know, life is not gonna end when you're 19, it's impossible. It was exciting to know that we were flying in areas where we weren't particularly safe uh, uh, and in aircraft that were old and the aircraft themselves weren't particularly safe at that time. Oh, look, the engine's on fire. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> uh, uh, I know it sounds a little stupid, but it was fun.
uh, until 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 twenty percent of my outfit got killed, uh, I enjoyed myself. The unit was given new planes, the Hercules, for a special mission. My best friend uh, was part of that crew and in a very real sense took over what had been my job. Electronic reconnaissance along the Turkish-Soviet border. The Hercules had orders to fly between the Trabzon and Van radio beacons and to keep the Soviets under surveillance. But the crew were not familiar with the new plane and mistakenly headed for the radio beacon at Yerevan, which transmitted on the same frequency. Our people in Darmstadt watched this plane miss Trabzon by maybe as much as 50 miles, and they watched it for nearly half an hour, I think, head toward what they knew was going to be uh, destruction. They had no radio contact and couldn't warn the Hercules that Soviet air defense was scrambling. Fighter planes took off and waited just over the border. The unarmed plane was easy prey. Original footage taken by Soviet MiG cameras. The Hercules went down within sight of the border. About two o'clock in the morning, I was woken up in my, uh, in my barracks and told that that plane had gone down. There was no indication given to us that the plane had been shot down, uh, that it had gone down, uh, probably in the Atlas Mountains in eastern Turkey, and that a crew of us were going to be sent down to look for it. Uh, uh, we, we were in shock. Bob Keefe was with the search party sent to look for survivors. One of my strongest memories is of the flight down and of us just sitting, about five of us, saying, you know, OK, we'll find them, we'll get them. Uh, they, uh, we're, going to, we're going to see something shining in one of these valleys and we're going to go down and we're going to get them and they're going to be very grateful. But the search party was purposely sent to the wrong area. High-ranking officers prepared a cover story while the men desperately searched for their missing comrades far from where they'd been shot down. I remember walking out. I remember walking off and crying. Uh, you don't at that age let anybody see you cry. I mean, that's, you can't be a man and cry. When the crew got back to Frankfurt, their rooms had been cleared out, papers had been destroyed, and all traces of them removed, as if the unit had never existed. My feeling is they used me as a puppet uh, and used people like me as a puppet uh, to buy time for themselves, uh, to make up some damned lie about what happened. The IG Farben building in Frankfurt, CIA European headquarters. Here, the cover story was cooked up. The spy mission became a navigational training flight that strayed off course. My second best friend among the group who, were, who was on that plane was married, had a two-year-old child, maybe, and his wife was five months pregnant. Uh, and I raised my hand and I asked uh, uh, how we could see them because I wanted to express my sympathy. I mean, I didn't know anything. I couldn't tell her anything. I could just say, I'm horrified. Uh, and, 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 and my feelings are, are with you. And we were forbidden. Military intelligence threatened the men with 10 years in jail and a $10,000 fine if they spoke out. After about two or three weeks, I wrote a petition saying that the refusal to let us talk to the wives and the refusal to tell anybody, including us, uh, anything, uh, anything like the truth about what happened was, was absolutely the wrong way to go. I said, I think, I said, uh, that you're, you're destroying people's lives by doing what you're doing. Keefe's commanding officers threatened to court-martial him and forced him to tear up his petition in their presence. 
I didn't know that my government would do that. Uh, my government at that point was, was a captain uh, uh, and a few people above him. I didn't know that Americans did that sort of thing. I thought that only Russians did that sort of thing. Shortly afterwards, Keefe volunteered for further missions in Turkey. I don't have a heroic bone in my body, but I can't explain why I had to. I had to. Uh, uh, yeah, I can explain. Uh, uh, I felt I should have been on the plane. It got shot down. And so I figured, OK, we'll give, the, we'll give them another shot at us. Keefe was not shot down, but he was marked forever by the events. Nineteen fifty-six. In Wiesbaden, the game of aerial chess continued. An Air Force general inspects reconnaissance planes of the 4799 support group for Operation Heartthrob. A high-altitude plane loaded with cameras violated the airspace of Soviet satellite states several times. An original photograph from a mission over Yugoslavia. From Bitburg, the same unit flew similar missions, now flying the Americans' first supersonic jets. The Soviet Air Force had no equivalent fighter interceptor. And the aircraft would launch out of Bitburg and climb to altitude, as, as, you know, quite high, and then penetrate as fast as he could, and then get to hang back out as fast as he could. In Wiesbaden, the CIA had its own planes. Their operations are secret to this day. They were flown by pilots from the Eastern Bloc country. A photo taken in Wiesbaden is the only proof that the mysterious RB69 ever flew out of Germany. Just seven planes were built, especially for the CIA. Not on the озлобленность против своей собственной, может быть, ну, не недоразвитости в области противовоздушной обороны. In Germany, the Americans meanwhile embarked on a new operation, Moby Dick. Automatic cameras the size of refrigerators were launched, suspended from hundreds of balloons. They drifted slowly across the Soviet Union at a height of 16 kilometers. When they reached the Pacific coast several days later, the cameras detached themselves from the balloons on a radio command. Specially equipped planes then recovered the cameras as they descended by parachute. The photos were mainly of uninhabited terrain, forests and snowy wastes. The balloons had drifted without guidance. The Soviets also shot many of them down when they lost altitude at night. They demonstrated their booty at an international press conference. This media interest was probably part of Washington's plans. Several things don't add up. For example, the balloons could easily have flown at an altitude of 25 kilometers, far higher than any aircraft. So why didn't they? Eisenhower ordered that the balloons be ballasted not to fly above 50, 55,000 feet, which was the altitude of the military aircraft. He did not want the Soviets preparing or initiating research projects to shoot things down at high altitude. Because the U-2 was nearly ready. A high-altitude reconnaissance plane developed and operated by the CIA. Air Force General LeMay opposed the U-2 in favor of continuing to send converted bombers over the Soviet Union. But the CIA got their way. It was their contention that this enterprise of flying um, uh, over the denied territory, as it was called, um, really wasn't a business that you could entrust to converted bombers, uh, and nor indeed to entirely to the military. 
General LeMay, shortly before the U-2 began flying, ordered the Cold War's most provocative operation, home run. From Thule in Greenland, 156 missions were flown over the Soviet Union in planes that might have carried atomic bombs. Sometimes they even flew in formation. Some historians believe LeMay wanted to start World War III. Not long afterwards, President Eisenhower forbade all American Air Force flights over the Soviet Union. The meetings in the White House to discuss how do we answer the Soviet protests for home run was to say that uh, because of the far north magnetic pole and the navigational problems, that if, if it were true that some planes had strayed into Soviet territory during training exercises, it was most regretted and it occurred because of navigational errors and so forth. The Soviet Air Force was powerless, compelled to recognize it could not defend its own country. A humiliating realization. In July 1956, the CIA put the U-2 into service. It was stationed at Wiesbaden. Only the CIA was now allowed to fly over the Soviet Union, and then only on the personal order of the president. Detachment A of the CIA was relocated to Germany under top secrecy. One of the biggest concerns that the CIA had was having to base the U-2 at Wiesbaden, uh, which was a base where they had other covert operations going on. Um, uh, they didn't like that one bit because um, the U-2 was being uh, run as a very tightly held and, and tightly compartmented operation, even within the CIA. The U-2 could fly higher than any other plane of its time. It carried the best camera in the world and specially designed film. 4th of July, 1956. On orders from President Eisenhower, CIA pilot Herbie Stockman was to find out whether the Soviets had more bombers than the USA. Both the Soviets and the American military, in rare consensus, claimed this was true. Stockman knew only which route he was to take. We were essentially drivers. We were good pilots. We were trustworthy. Uh, and that's the, way they, that's the way they wanted us to be. Uh, don't get in our way. Don't ask too many questions. And I accepted that. The Soviets detected the U-2, but they were powerless and had to watch it photograph their secret bases from high above Soviet fighters. One of the questions I asked myself, but not in any sort of a penetrating fashion, was, uh, where is this threat, you know? The U-2's photos were sensational. The photos showed how weak the Soviet Air Force was. All the menacing talk about the bomber gap and Soviet superiority was just propaganda. When Gary Powers took off in 1960, the U-2s had already been flying two years longer than originally planned. According to the CIA, the Soviets had been able to shoot them down since 1958. On May the 1st, 1960, it happened. Khrushchev tried to exploit the shooting down for propaganda purposes and arranged a show trial. Powers had not used his poisoned needle to commit suicide. The American military still take this badly. An irony of fate. On the day Powers was sentenced, the USA launched its first spy satellite. The era of overflights was over. But electronic reconnaissance continued. This special R version of the B-47 was so secret that there is no film of it in flight. 
Crammed with electronic spying devices, it flew parallel to Soviet territory and sometimes over it. With electronic intelligence, what you're trying to do is to come up with a method of getting you to that target and hopefully getting you back out of it. Uh, you have to build an effective defense to, to uh, overcome their defenses. The RB-47 was a high-tech machine and an improvisation. You're sitting up front in the aisle, three of you, in a space normally occupied by one man. And you're wearing a five-inch thick back parachute and water wings and a helmet and then Nordic clothing, which makes it even harder. And you have to go down a very small chute on this ladder that had a faulty latch on it and find your way into the crawlway. Now, getting up from your position was a, a real chore, but getting into the crawlway was an art. You really had to work at it and then make your way down that crawlway without snagging anything and popping your parachute or initiating your water wings. When you got to the end of the crawlway, you laid flat on your belly and uh, went through the small hatch into the compartment. And uh, that was relished because it was the only time and place in that airplane that you could stretch out. Because once you got in the compartment, it was four feet high and you couldn't stand or, or even squat good anymore. So you were pretty crowded and, and confined from then on. The Soviets intercepted the reconnaissance planes and escorted them, at times dangerously close. Sometimes they attacked. If they thought we were getting in the wrong area or, or getting information they didn't want to to lose, then they would have the fighters either chase us off or try to destroy us. Then there was only one thing for it. We used the tactic of getting around on the deck at maximum speed and running from them. Close to sea level, the missile's guidance system didn't work, and the fighters didn't have enough fuel for a flat-out chase over the sound barrier. The airplane went beyond Buffett where you got no ailerons and then aileron reversal and uh, we were doing everything we could to stay alive. We landed the airplane that was crusted with salt on all the leading edges, and uh, the uh, wings had warped so badly that they couldn't remove the outboard engines. It was one of many highly dangerous missions which have remained secret until now. The American pilots did not always manage to escape. July 1960. An electronic reconnaissance plane flew from England to Murmansk. As we came up to the turning point, the um, co-pilot suddenly said, check, 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 right wing. Polyakov instructed the bomber to follow him. Without any warning, started firing his cannon at our aircraft, and the cannon shells hit the number two and three engines. And then I saw these holes this big around open up where I sat in the nose. Looked like more cannon shells coming through. And then I heard the aircraft commander say, uh, bail out, bail out, bail out. And then I saw red alarm lights flash for the bail out and the alarm bells rang. And then I saw a fire coming down from the uh, aisle behind me, and then I heard an explosion behind me, which sounded like the canopy of the airplane leaving, and then I heard another explosion, and I figured, time to get out of this mother. At 14,000 feet, where my chute opened automatically, and then I saw this beautiful blue sea. And I was born and raised in Kansas. I was never around the ocean, and I had no idea what an ocean was like. And uh, but it was um, 65 degrees Fahrenheit or so, so it was fairly warm. But we were also told by our intelligence officer that the water was 33 degrees up there. Besides McCone, only Olmsted, the co-pilot, survived. The pilot and three electronic specialists died. They said 18 minutes as long as you'd last in calm water. 
And uh, I was out there not for 18 minutes, but six hours. McCone fought for his life and started to pray. All of a sudden, right off the end of my dinghy, I could almost reach out and touch it, it was so close, was this terribly bright light. And it was so bright that I had to shield my eyes from it and put my hands up like this. And I knew that that was the Holy Spirit. I know that God was with me. And all of a sudden, nobody spoke to me, but I knew at that particular time that John McCone would be saved, that I'd be rescued, and that everything was going to be all right. Then a Soviet trawler zigzagged through the crash area. McCone yelled and waved and was spotted. The co-pilot was rescued too. I was putting the uh, Lubyanka and put in a solitary cell. The door was a solid wooden door with a little Judas hole, as we call it on it. So when they shut that door, you were almost in a soundproof cell. And that's kind of eerie. They had women in solitary there. They had uh, children in the solitary. And they, sometimes they'd go in and beat these people, and they'd scream and holler. And, uh, and I remember that there was a fellow next to me in uh, the adjoining shell, and uh, he started losing his mind. And he'd run up against the cell door, and you could hear him p -p 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 pow, you know, hit that door, and then p -p 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 pow. A 300 watt light bulb prevented deep sleep, a subtle method of torture. I figured that it might be a long stay, and that I'd be prepared for that. So I would do all kinds of physical exercises myself. I'd do maybe up to 50 push-ups. You'd count all the hairs from your elbow and up to your wrist, uh, just to have something to do. You'd daydream too, of course, about uh, your childhood days and when you went fishing and all this business. And... But you had to watch that because after a while you could kind of feel yourself going over the edge of reality. <laughs> Sleep deprivation, solitary confinement, starvation. The KGB's gentler methods of getting prisoners to talk. The USA publicly demanded the prisoners release, but McCone didn't know. His world was endless interrogation. And I was interrogated four and five hours a stretch with an hour break, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. This went on for a number of weeks uh, before I said name, rank, service number, and date of birth isn't going to do it. Endless interrogations. After months of solitary confinement, he met his co-pilot again for the first time. He lost about 70 pounds. I lost about 70 pounds. He looked at me and I looked at him and we didn't even recognize each other. And finally, I saw something familiar about his eyes and I said, are you, you Bruce Olmstead? And he looked at me and burst out in tears and ran over and gave me a big bear hug and kiss and he said, Yes, thank God, it's John McCone. Finally, after seven months, McCone was released as an inaugural gift for the new president, John F. Kennedy. McCone was lucky. Many remained missing. Were there other survivors? We looked at another case, the downing of the privateer in 1950. One document has been overlooked for more than 50 years, a German prisoner of war's report to the CIA. In the Vorkuta Gulag, the German met a pilot who called himself Waterwolf. Was this a play on Sea Sheep? Seeschaf in German, the missing American Howard Seeschaf. The report's description of Waterwolf matches Seeschaf, and there were other similarities. Waterwolf said he had flown from Berlin to Moscow, both true and false. Seeschaf flew from Germany to the Soviet Union. Waterwolf said he had been born in Japan, true and false. Seisha fought in the Second World War against the Japanese. Was Japan where Seisha stopped being a civilian to become Waterwolf, the soldier? Could Seisha have survived being shot down? 
The Soviet pilot's report at the time was unambiguous. He said the privateer had exploded in the air. Now he tells the truth on camera for the first time. In the command point, they brought the paper and the paper. An officer dictated the official report. No survivors. A deliberate lie. There were parachutes. I said, the parachutes were found on the ground. On the ground, they were given the parachutes. Don't move, you have to do the task. I saw that the number of parachutes was about 10 feet. Everything was ready for the Americans, even the rescue ships. But why did Gerasimov give false testimony to a Russian-American commission in 1993? A mistake. It's still unclear whether there were American spy pilots in the Vokuta camp. We took our findings to the Russian-American Commission investigating the fate of missing servicemen, but they refused to give us an interview. Why? Have the men in the Gulag been secretly abandoned? One former soldier tells of his own bitter experiences. I believe that bureaucracies can be incredibly destructive and I believe that military, uh, uh, that national military systems are the ultimate bureaucracy, and a, and a bureaucracy which is which has guns, and another bureaucracy which has the absolute ability to remain secret and not tell anything it doesn't want to tell. Those are two very dangerous bureaucracies. The struggle for air supremacy was top secret. We know it claimed men's lives, but among the missing were some sacrificed to a more important cause. The military would like that to stay a secret forever.